With the North's victory in the Civil War came the end of slavery long sought by abolitionists who now had to decide what policies to champion regarding the freedmen, particularly the question of voting rights. The renowned historian C. Van Woodward fleshed out this dilemma in his essay, The Political Legacy of the First Reconstruction. As this passage shows, even the staunchest abolitionists weren't as gung-ho on the idea of black suffrage as one might expect. Representative of the skeptical and negative attitude of the time is the following pronouncement. When was it ever known that liberation from bondage was accompanied by a recognition of political equality? Chattel's personal may be instantly translated from the auction block into freedmen, but when were they ever taken at the same time to the ballot box and invested with all political rights and immunities? According to the laws of development and progress, it is not practicable, nor, if the freed blacks were admitted to the polls by presidential fiat, do I see any permanent advantage likely to be secured by it. For, submitted to as a necessity at the outset, as soon as the state was organized and left to manage its own affairs, the white population, with their superior intelligence, wealth, and power, would unquestionably alter the franchise in accordance with their prejudices and exclude those thus summarily brought to the polls. Coercion would gain nothing. The author of these sentiments, written in 1864, was none other than William Lloyd Garrison of the Liberator, the man who swore to be harsh as truth and uncompromising as justice. Nor was he alone among the abolitionists in these sentiments, for the radicals themselves were divided on the matter of Negro suffrage. Even Senator Charles Sumner, one of the earlier and most powerful advocates of placing the ballot in the freedmen's hands, was prepared in a Senate speech on February 5, 1866, to admit that educational qualifications for the suffrage would be advisable. At that time, of course, educational restrictions, even a literacy test fairly administered, would have limited the franchise to a small minority of the freedmen. Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune, an old friend of the slave, would limit the voting privilege to the competent and deserving, and suggested such qualifications as ability to read and write, payment of taxes, or establishment in a trade. General O. O. Howard, head of the Freedmen's Bureau, hoped that the franchise would be limited at least by an educational qualification. This far, of course, President Lincoln and President Johnson were prepared to go, and both, in fact, did unsuccessfully recommend to Southern states such franchise laws. To go further than that in 1866 or even later was to incur grave political risks that even the most radical of Republicans were reluctant to assume. Only five states in the North, all with a negligible percentage of colored population, provided for Negro franchise. In 1865, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Connecticut defeated proposals to allow the Negroes to vote, and the Nebraska Constitution of 1866 confined suffrage to whites. New Jersey and Ohio in 1867, and Michigan and Pennsylvania in 1868 turned down proposals for Negro suffrage. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, who contends that in 1861, probably not one white American in a hundred believed that Negroes could become an integral part of American democracy, concludes that even by 1868, the country was not ready for Negro suffrage. Yet Negro suffrage did come. It came very quickly. In fact, by 1868, it had already come in the South. How it came and why are important determinants in the political legacy left the South and the American Negro by Reconstruction. Thaddeus Stevens, foremost champion of the freedmen, master of the Republican House majority, and leader of Radical Reconstruction, was advocating some extremely radical measures. He was quite ready to disenfranchise Southern whites in great numbers and to confiscate great quantities of their land. It is intended to revolutionize their feelings and principles, he declared. This may startle feeble minds and shake weak nerves. So do all great improvements. To those who objected to humiliating the defeated foe, he replied, why not? Do not they deserve humiliation? If they do not, who does? What criminal, what felon deserves it more? But for all his radicalism, Stevens was not yet prepared to enfranchise the Negro freedmen. For one thing, of course, he knew that public opinion would not support it 
and that the majority of his own party was against it. But apart from political reasons, he had other doubts about the wisdom of the measure, some of them similar to those expressed by Garrison, Greeley, Howard, and for that matter, President Andrew Johnson. On this vital matter, Stevens, contrary to his reputation, can be classified as a moderate or conservative. For one thing, he doubted that the freedmen were prepared for intelligent voting. The conditions and laws of slavery, he said, on December 18, 1865, have prevented them from acquiring an education, understanding the commonest laws of contract, or of managing the ordinary business of life. The following month, on January 31, 1866, while urging a constitutional amendment basing representation in the House on the number of qualified voters in a state, Stevens actually expressed hope that the southern states would not immediately grant the freedmen suffrage and thereby increase southern voting power in Congress. He assumed that the Negroes would fall under the political influence of their former masters. I do not, therefore, want to grant them this privilege for some years, four or five years hence, when the freedmen shall have been made free indeed, when they shall have become intelligent enough and there are sufficient loyal men there to control the representation from those states, Negro voting would be safe enough. In fact, at this time, Stevens adopted a state's rights position. I hold that the states have the right, and always have had it, to fix the elective franchise within their own states. One irony of this passage is that it shows how little daylight there was at this time on the subject of black suffrage between radical Republicans like Thaddeus Stevens and former Confederate Vice President Alexander H. Stevens, a notorious defender of slavery. We discussed the latter Stevens's 1865 prison diary entry on black voting rights in the last video. Like Thaddeus Stevens and William Lloyd Garrison, he supported expanding the franchise with similar restrictions and possible time delays. Noting another irony, Woodward went on to observe that, after enfranchisement was in full effect in the southern states, the Republican Party felt obliged to give specific promise to the people of the North that they would be left free to keep the Negro disenfranchised in their own states. In the Republican platform of 1868 appeared the following, the guarantee by Congress of equal suffrage to all loyal men at the South was demanded by every consideration of public safety, of gratitude, and of justice, and must be maintained, while the question of suffrage in all loyal states properly belongs to the people of those states. Only after the presidential election was over and General Grant had won, did the party dare bring forward the 15th Amendment denying the right of any state to disenfranchise the Negro, and not until 1870 was its ratification completed. Woodward further noted that, after the 15th Amendment was passed, the North rapidly lost interest in the Negro voters. They were pushed out of the limelight by other interests, beset by prejudices, and neglected by politicians. The Northern Negro did not enjoy a fraction of the political success the Southern Negro enjoyed, as modest as that was. As an example of what Woodward calls the North's loss of faith in its own cause, Woodward cites a January 17, 1877 diary entry by Hamilton Fish, President Ulysses S. Grant's Secretary of State. He says that he opposed the 15th Amendment and thinks it was a mistake, that it had done the Negro no good and had been a hindrance to the South and by no means a political advantage to the North. Lots to chew on in this episode, thanks to those of you who watched it all the way through. Please subscribe if you haven't already and share with anyone who might be interested. See you next time.